in Jesus' name. We call it done. Amen. Bless God forever. Amen. I appreciate you all being with me today because of the fact I have some things that we need to discuss. And since the Most High God is always there for us watching the eyes of the Lord, the Bible says go to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking and seeking someone that he, that he can show himself strong in their behalf. And just thank God for Pastor Great Fan for Andrina and for the beautiful way that he lifted her up from last night from the daytime to where now she's resting. I appreciate him for that because his spirit, his spirit is the quicken. His word is the quicken. He is the quicken and to give life. Today, I just want you to think for a moment. Why is it that we walk this walk? Is it so that we can come together and think we have insurance to keep us from going to hell? Is it so that we can know something that other people don't know? Tomorrow is what is called Shavuot. It's called the feast of the Passover. Maybe if the Lord spares us next year, I may do something exactly on that day in the assembly. Right, they call it Pentecost. Pentecost, the Greek word Pentecostes means 50. But before it ever got to the hands of the Greeks, it wasn't called Pentecost. It was set, he counted seven Sabbaths from another Sabbath, the 50th day, according to Leviticus chapter 23, is the day of Shavuot. But there is something that magnificently wonderful happened on that day. On that day, Yah Most High, he gave to his people, his commands, his instructions to rule the world. I need somebody on the conference line to mute their phone, please, because I don't have the ability to do it. But he gave his commandments. He gave his power. He gave the ability for them to know what it would take to be in control. No, just mute your phone. That's okay. It was just somebody else who called in. That's all. How are we going to look at that? You see, I've been teaching for the last few weeks, roughly 48 days, I've been teaching about the difference between Passover and Easter. I've been showing that Easter is a damnable day. It's a damnable holiday. It is absolutely unequivocally pagan. It can, you, have the, you have the rabbit, you have the egg and all that in Egypt. You have it going out through other cultures. You get it going out through the Greeks. You got it going through the Romans. And now you have it from the people that came from Europe and brought it over here into what they call the Americas through the name of Easter. But that's not the big deal. The day of Pentecost is the day that the Holy Spirit was given as well. There's a thing called type and shadow in the Bible. For instance, the Messiah is not a lamb, yet he is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If I say that he takes away the sin of the world, please don't think that I'm saying he's taking away the sin of people that are still living in ungodliness that are not in covenant with God most high. Because if you think that way, you're thinking very ignorantly. He takes away the sins of the world. Adam brought sin into the world, and there was a death penalty and a curse placed on man because all the sin and death reigned, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. So death reigned on those that did not sin, even after the same way, the same similitude that, that Adam did. So the real issue is he removed that from individuals that are in covenant with him. The curse still remains for those that do not. And it gets intensified. Tim, why do you say it gets intensified? Because the Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not. Notice I said should not. Because there, there's an element there that you look at that it's adoptive. It, it, it's an element that it, it might, it, something might happen and mess that up. 
Well, keep reading, Jim. So it says, should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Yes, but it's a, that the real issue is, and the real problem is, he that believes on the name of the son of God is not condemned. See the qualifier? But he that believeth not, that means a continual active. Oh, it's called present active indicative, but a continual active. He that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed on the name of the only begotten son of God. Therefore, the Messiah came into the world. He came into the world to be a blessing. He came into the world to be the savior of the world. But if an individual does not take him as his Lord, as his ruler, as his sovereign, that individual is going to be cursed by the very one that came to bring a blessing. I will submit to you that that Jesus the Christ, or Yeshua HaMashiach, he's a blessing to some and he's damnation to others. He is not neutral. According to the scriptures, you either gather with me, he said, or you scatter. You either for me or you're against me. Because he came into the world, there is no longer a cloak given for individuals and their sins and their wickedness and their ungodliness. The same Christ that came to bless, that's the blessing of the world, is the same one that seals their condemnation and their damnation. How much more so then when we start looking at the Holy Spirit, the blessed Holy Spirit. Let's go ahead and share this magnificent screen and let's start squeezing the juice out of the blessed word of God. You all know I love the word of God. I'm not just talking. I just don't want to make you all feel like I like it and I'm lying through my teeth. I don't do no mess like that. So, 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 we've already dealt with Pentecost, not Pentecost, we've already dealt with what is called the Passover. And in dealing with what is called the Passover, we realized people took the name of that and they changed it to Easter. And the children of Israel went through a wilderness, and we've been going through the wilderness with them for a while, but I need you to understand something about these people. They were given... God's holy and righteous laws within the first year. Yet, we have people been going to what we call church for 30 or 40 years, 50 years, and don't know the word of God, don't know the importance of the word of God, and they saying that they're full and full of the Holy Ghost. And I just spoke to a woman this morning when I went to go get something for my wife, and she told me that she was Pentecostal. And I said, what good has it done you? She said, she just got a divorce. I said, what good has it done you? I said, do you still fornicate? When your body get an itch, do you find someone to scratch it? Do you find yourself living outside of God's will? And she got quiet. And I didn't need her to think I liked her. But I also saw that this is a soul. I could die today and I would have had the opportunity to talk to her and didn't. I said, ma'am, if you're full of the spirit or if you're Pentecostal and you have the spirit and you're not walking like the most high God, I said, what good has it done you? I submit to you, let's look at the shadow, the shadow of Pentecost, Shavuot, and then let's look, look at the substance. So we're going to go back to the shadow, the training wheels, as I call it, riding a bike with a training wheel, and let's move to where we ride the bike without the training wheels, okay? Because the most High God is still the same. So again, our title for today, in many different ways I'll say it, but the one that's written is Ignoring the Curse of the Fulfillment slash Substance of the Holy Spirit. It does not make it go away. Let me explain. The shadow is the most high God giving his law. The substance of what God is doing at Pentecost, Shavuot, is giving his spirit and writing the words in your heart. The shadow, he wrote it on stones. Some people were able to extract from what he did with the stones and have it written in their heart. And the reason for that is so that they would be empowered to do his will and to conquer 
and to heaven as the earth, like Messiah taught his disciples to pray. You pray when you pray. That's not how I'm going to pray. Our Father, because you have a different type. You had to be adopted into the family of God. I'm born that way. I'm made that way. I'm born that way in the earth. I was already the son of God before I took on humanity. And it says, you say, our father, which art in heaven, you high above us, hallowed, holy, set apart, dignified, other than all else is your name. Your kingdom come. This is the this is the thing. Your kingdom come. It's not just that your kingdom come on the earth and they see it. Your kingdom come in us because the kingdom of God comes not with observation according to 17th chapter of Luke verse 21. Neither will you say, no, is it here or no, is it there? It says the kingdom of God is in you. It really is saying it's in your midst. And wherever the king is, his kingdom is. Yes, I will. It didn't, it didn't let me know. Let me make sure. Okay, I turned the volume up. That should help me a lot. And because I didn't know I had not let people in. Because I really need him to be in. He's such a person. Okay. I need I need anyone that's on the anyone that's on the Zoom. I need them to say something. Unmute your phone and say, I want to make sure I can still hear you, okay? Something. Beautiful. I appreciate that, Colonel Seal. So the kingdom of God, it doesn't come with observation. It's in you. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Notice, in earth, you have the other one that said, on earth as it is in heaven. What are we? We are vessels. We are earthen vessels in which the spirit of God is well. In earth as it is in heaven, give us day by day our daily bread like he did them with manna. And the Messiah said, it's not just bread alone, but every word that proceed out of God, that's our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And I submit to you, don't, I used to not pray. He said pray. But you be careful when you pray, you ask God to forgive you the way you forgive others. Believe that. You better understand if you're going to hold them to a righteous standard, that's the way you need to forgive, with a righteous standard. Bring forth fruit, meet for repentance like he teaches in the scripture. And you know these things, if you would have known, the children of God would have known that's what the Most High taught them when he gave them his laws on the mountain. He said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's one of the accounts of the prayer. It stops there. But the other one, it is for thine is the kingdom, his kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Why would you have two? One just left out apart. Okay, that doesn't mean it's contradictory. It's just like you tell a story and I tell a story, something happened. Say we went to a game and I tell the story and I tell it accurately, you tell it accurately, but this other part I didn't tell. Does that mean what I'm saying is wrong? No, but I didn't see that part. Or it wasn't told to me that part. Luke was not there. Luke is actually given the treaty that he was given, and he had full account of what was given. And you're writing something to somebody for them to read to understand what happened. Don't play with me, because I know he says that in his second epistle that he talked about as well as the first one. Read the first chapter, you'll know that. But let's, let's look at what happened. In Exodus chapter 19, the Most High God, he talks about what he would do for Israel. I will make you a kingdom of priests. Kingdom on earth. I'm going to make you a kingdom of priests. I'm going to have you. You already are my sons. I'm going to send you to execute my judgment on the world. Why is it then if he was going to do that for them at the Passover? Why is it then after the lamb was killed, they were supposed to walk out and they were supposed to walk out in the power of the most high and they were supposed to be instructed in the power and in the word of the most high. Why is it then we can't walk in resurrection power now? What good did the Messiah die and Jesus died on the cross do for us if we're not walking in resurrection power? What good was it? At least what good was it for you? Because if you're not going to walk in the power of the Most High God, that's damnation to you. But Tim, why would you say this on the day of Pentecost? When else should I say it? 
It's only one day away from here. Let's, 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 let's look at it. In Exodus chapter 24, they said they were going to do what he said in Exodus chapter 19. And so now Moses is going up into the mountain to get this. This law that God has given is what they call on Shavuot Pentecost. So in Exodus chapter 24, verse 2, listen to what the Bible says. It says, and Moses alone shall come near the Lord, and they shall not come nigh. Neither shall the people go up with him. That's into the mountain. And Moses came and told the people all the words of Yah. And all the judgment and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said will we do. The Most High God is not sending them out to conquer the world. He's not sending them out to be his representatives with what they think or with what they feel or what they learned in Egypt or what they learned from the high vice, the Jebusites, yes, or any of the other nations that are there. I'm going to tell you what I need you to do. I'm going to tell you how I want you to do it. I'm going to tell you your position in the world under me and my position over you and over the world. And this is what I demand of you as I have saved you because I didn't save you to make you happy. I didn't save you to make you feel good. I didn't save you so you could get on TV and, TV and sing and beg for money. I saved you so that you would do my purpose in the earth. The same way I'll send my son the Messiah to do my purpose in earth. So much so you hear the Messiah say, I do always those things that please you. And, my, and the Bible says, and the Bible says in verse four, and Moses wrote all the words of Yahweh and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrifice peace offerings of oxen, to the Lord, somebody that just joined in, please mute your phone on the conference line. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basin, the, the blood of the animals, and put it in and put it in the basins. And half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Notice he is shedding, not shedding, but he's taking blood and he's putting the blood on the altar. Verse seven. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people and said, this is what they said, all that Yahweh have said will we do and be obedient. This is what the people said on what we would call Pentecost, Shavuot. They said all that he said, he said something. And they said, we'll be subject. We'll do things the way he wants it to be done. His kingdom will be spread the way he wants it to be done. In other words, we will not set our own agenda. We will follow his agenda. And he says, all that Yahweh has said, will we do and be obedient? And verse 8 says, and Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. Somebody got to turn their, somebody got to turn their um, phone on mute on the, on the uh, Zoom because I'm hearing feedback on a different conversation. I've, I'm going to figure out how to make it where I can mute everything until I want to let it in, but I don't know how to do it yet. I was studying it last night, but I was on the short bus. I got Naomi, you, can you teach me how to do that after class, how to make it where no one can come in with, on the audio until I let them in? Okay, if you can't, you, you're still in school. Somebody can tell you, one of your friends. Let's go back to verse 8. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you concerning all these words. I submit to you that that blood being shed was a representation of the people being shed or whoever violated this commandment, their blood being shed. And this blood has been shed and this blood has been put on the people, it's been put on the ark of the, I mean, on the uh, tabernacle and they have sworn by the blood. And if they go against this blood, that blood is a curse against them. It becomes a curse because they have sworn by the blood that all that the most I said, will we do and be obedient. And there are people today swear by the blood in their dirt and their wickedness against God and plead the blood. Where did you find it in the Bible? How do you make mockery of such a thing that is so powerful? 
and so important to our lives. The shed blood of the Most High Son, the shed blood of the animals that the Lord used to sanctify the people coming out of Egypt. And the Bible says that they saw the God of Israel and under his feet as it were a paved work of sapphire stone and as it was a great, as it were the body of heaven in clearness. And the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hands also, they saw God and did eat and drink. Now notice this, verse 12, and Yahweh said to Moses, come up to me in the mountain and be there and I will give you tables of stone and a law and a Torah and commandments which I've written that you may teach them. This is the problem with America. This is the problem with other countries of the world. They're going to make you subject to laws you don't know, that you don't understand, and you got to pay to get justice. The most high God system was, I'm going to give you my laws. I'm going to give you everything that you need. And when I give you everything that you need, there will not be a lawyer. There will not be a doctor. There will not be a preacher. Any of those people that can take and keep justice from you and you not know it. The most high wanted us to be people that could go into all the world. He wanted us to be light to the world. He wanted us to be salt in the earth. You can't be light in the world when you're in darkness. You can't be salt in the earth when you have already lost your saltiness. This is his purpose of giving them his righteous law. He wanted them to know, to be competent. Most of us aren't competent. I'm not competent in American law. It's not stable. It's not set. It changes. They do stuff based on precedent. And if the man that was wicked before did it on precedent, just like in 1857, when, when Chief Justice Roger Taney said that a black man has no rights, that a white man has to follow. So if I did something today, if they went back to that precedent, I got nothing. You want to be constitutional? That's what people say. I want to be constitutional. I need somebody to mute their phone on the conference line. Please just hit the mute button and I'll be good. And it says, in their laws, you follow that, and America goes by the rule of law. But the Most High God, His law, His statutes, and His covenants are based in Him. They don't change because he doesn't change. So verse 13 says that Moses rose up with his minister and Joshua, Yahashua, and Moses went up into the mouth of God. And he said to the elders, tarry here until we come again unto you. Behold, Aaron and her are with you. And if any man has any matters to do, let him come unto them. I want you to look at this. This is very important for you to see the substance or the fulfillment of the type and the shadow when we go to Acts. In verse 15, it says, And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount, and the glory of Yahweh abode on the mountain, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud, and the sight of the glory of Yahweh was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. And then from there, you'll hear Yahweh tell them what they're to do to build the tabernacle, to get the tabernacle ready so that his presence can dwell therein. If I was to read it, he goes through and show you what needs to be done to get the tabernacle ready. I submit to you that when we look and we see what we get ready to see in the book of Acts, in the book of Acts, I want you to understand that when the Most High God comes and His Spirit sets on the people, like cloven tongue, C L O V E N tongue, and sets and rests on the people, this is a representation of what happened then. And the Most High is going to teach the people what they need to do to prepare their tabernacle for Him to dwell in so that they can go and rule, so that they can have their sins dealt with, so that they would know what they're supposed to do. When they go out into the world, I submit to you that we cut God short when all we think about is we just want to get saved. For real? You want to get saved by God and sit down and do your dirt and live 40, 50, 60 wretched years and then he take you to heaven and think you're great. Oh, you make me sick. Now let's read. Let's look at this parallel. Let's look at Exodus chapter 23. Verse number 20, after all this happened, when he first told them what he would do in chapter 19, 
I went to where he did it, giving them his law, coming out, showing them the fire show. If you read the book of Hebrews, Moses said he exceedingly feared and quaked. There were earthquakes and all that. I didn't want to read all of that because I want to get into something even more uh, pertinent to most people because they just like New Testament. But I need them to understand that that didn't just drop out of the sky. This is something most I have been working with them for a while. But in Exodus chapter 23, verse 20, listen to what the Lord said he would do. The first time they said all that the Lord has said will we do. And when Moses went up into the mountain after he says what he says in chapter 23, then he comes down and they make covenant together. So what did God say that he would do for these people? And these people agreed to what I just read. Well, in Exodus chapter 23 and 20, the Bible says, Yahweh said, behold, I send an angel. Not, don't think of somebody, don't think of somebody that looked like what you maybe say Brad Pitt or, or somebody that looked like uh, the old Batman or, 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 think, or think of somebody that looked like Gilligan or, or somebody that looked like that dude in, when I was young called Fabio. No, no, no. An angel. The, the Hebrew word is malak. Let me just show you. I click on the word and you look at malak. That's a messenger. For those that don't know that an angel is a messenger, see here, malak, messenger. It can either be a human, it can be a spirit, it can be a watch, etc. So it says, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way, to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice, provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. Now this is what he's telling them before he makes covenant with them. I'm sending my message to be in the presence of you. I'm sending my message, my name is in him. I'm sending my messenger, don't disobey him. Don't provoke him. This law that I'm getting ready to give you, this covenant that I'm getting ready to give you, is full of blessings, but it's going to be full of curses. It's full of blessings and it's going to be full of curses. Do you want to be blessed? Do so and live and be blessed. But if you provoke him, my name is in him. He will not forgive your mess. That's not, that's not what the King James says. So let me read what it says. It says that thou shalt, well, let me read it again. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, he will not pardon your transgressions for my name is in him. In other words, he won't do it because my name is in him. But if you still indeed obey, here's the blessing. If you obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies. Blessings, wouldn't you like that if the history of us in America was a God, Yahweh, Most High, was an enemy of to our enemies? The first time they stole one of us. First time they shot one of us. First time they raped one of us. The first time they sodomized one of our men. The first time they fed any one of us to the shark. The first time they amputated one of us. The Most High fall. The first time they laid the lash on us a thousand licks, 300 licks have branded us in the face. Why is it that when we look in the word of God, we don't see that his Torah, his instructions are to bless, but curse if we turn against him? Because somebody has already told you a narrative that you don't need his law, his righteous instruction, or that grace actually kills the will of God. Oh, I mean, it's, it, that's the effect of what we're taught. So it said, if you'll, in, if you'll indeed or in truth obey my voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to thine enemies and an adversary unto thy adversaries. And when he says an adversary, a lot of times adversary is a word that we call devil because we just think devil as a being as opposed to adversary. That developed as the Lord most high story showing them more and more that there would be one person that was the true, the real adversary that other adversaries were like. Verse 23, for mine angel shall go before thee and bring thee into the land of the Amorites. This land you got to go in and conquer. Now, I want you to start seeing the parallel as I go. 
When the Holy Spirit is supposed to be in us, he's supposed to be leading us, right? He's supposed to be guiding us, right? He's supposed to be giving us what we need. Uh, that's what 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is. All of these gifts and things that he gives us for us to be able to go and do the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of the Messiah till we grow up into the measure of the stature of the fullness of the Christ. But we're not going to do those kind of things. What good is the Holy Spirit in your life? What good is your Pentecostalism? And what good is this doing these people that's going to die in the wilderness? 605,000. If you don't see a difference between the Most High God and His Word, you're good. If you see one, you got a problem. If you don't see a difference between the Messiah and His Word, you got a problem. If you don't see, and what I mean, the difference, the difference is in this case, one is made flesh, but he's still the same. If you don't see that the Messiah's word and the Father's word are the same, you don't understand how the day of Pentecost is in actuality a fulfillment of what he was trying to bring these people to. He was trying to get them to the place that they would have a tabernacle. God wanted to prepare our bodies to be a tabernacle for the Holy Spirit, which is in us, which we have of God. We are not our own. That's what I read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and 19 and 20, but maybe some people's Bible don't say that, but mine does. So he's going to bring them into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now listen, and I will cut, and look, and I will cut them off. Verse 24, thou shalt not bow down to their gods, whether it's Santa, and start they, whether it's a little fat baby dog for me, shoot people in, in with the arrow, call them Cupid, whether it's the day of the dead with the druids and all of that, which other days that they come up and maybe something that they set up and said, we're going to do something and we're going to represent and say things, oh, I wish I could tell you all, all of the holidays that they do, but you're not able to bear it, many people. You're not able to bear it. Because you're still loving Christmas. And one of the problems with Christmas is, is that was the day that was Christianized to bring it to you, to give it to you, that was given to people, and they would do things with Tammuz, they would do things with the god Saturn, and the problem is that you don't understand that you're amalgamating yourself with the wickedness of these other gods. You don't want to be holy. You don't want to be righteous. You like these days, you love them, and it's called Christian anity. And I will submit to you that when the Roman Catholic Church separated the world, you better hear me look up the word doctrine of discovery. In the doctrine of discovery, when they wrote that doctrine of discovery in 1493, after 1492, when they said this man Columbus discovered America, and he did. Christopher Columbus did discover America in 1492. Somebody said, I ain't going to listen to you. I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about. Do you not know what I'm talking about? Right. Because discovering America is not discovering the land uh, and that it wasn't already here and there were not people already here. When you have people that deal with philological alchemy, in other words, change the narrative, they change the narrative. If you go there and the people aren't Christians, they are savages, and you go and you Christianize them or you civilize them. And when you civilize them, that means you Christianize them for what they were already believing. And they made the world split from the Portuguese, and they did it with the Spanish under the Roman Catholic Church. And they made people start learning and believing and worshiping their gods, their holy days, and it went away from God's shabu oak. Now, here's the point. He discovered America for the Catholic Church under, this, under the doctrine of discovery that we can take your land, we can take your women, we can take your gold, we can take your silver, etc. That's why when you hear the enslavers say that the black people were savages, according to their narrative, you would have been. Because you wouldn't have been doing that Jesus. You wouldn't have been doing that Mary. You wouldn't have been doing that Christmas. You wouldn't have been doing that Easter. You wouldn't even be doing White Day, a White Sunday. I'll show you White Sunday if I have time. White Sunday is what they call the day of Pentecost. Yes, White Sunday. I submit to you, he did discover America according to their term. And when you're dealing with legalities, Look and see what people mean, okay? But the Most High God said, you should not bow down to their gods or their demons, nor serve them, nor do after their works. This is 
This, I'm going to give you my law so that you will have power not to do it. So you'll be banned from doing it. And you all said all that he said will we do and be obedient. Neither shall you, you look, but thou shalt utterly overthrow them. I'm trying to overthrow them in your mind where it matters. I'm trying to overthrow them by giving you what God's word has said about it. You shall quite break down their images. Listen, and you shall serve Yahweh your God, and he will bless your bread and your water. I will take away sickness away from the midst of thee. And there shall nothing cast out their young or be barren in the land. Of the numbers of thy days I will fulfill. And I will send my fear before thee. Why we don't have fear before us when you can take a young boy, a young man, and they chase him down with a car, hit him with a car, and kill him, and you're not even going to have a trial, and you weren't even going to take him to court. And then finally you got to take him to court, and you see that the whole system is going to just let him be dead like a dog. Ain't no fear before God, before us, when you can go and shoot up a church full of people and no big deal. Ain't no fear before God, before us, when you can take a young dude. I believe it is in Val Dust and gut him up like a doggone fish and roll him up in some carpet. There's no fear before God when it comes to us when they can go to Buffalo and shoot us down like dogs. Do they try to make fear in your heart if you shoot anybody else? We need the most high because he's got the best media ever. It's better than CNN, Fox, ABC, MSNBC, all of the radio stations combined. How do you say that, Tim? TBN is not that big. Uh, and TBN too. Who is TBN? They talk more ungodliness and they talk worse things that I've seen on movies like Mission Impossible, not movies, but the TV show. Let me tell you about God's media. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech. Night unto night gives forth knowledge. There is no language and speech in which it cannot be heard. It's God's media. You see, the visible things of him show forth and talk about his invisible things, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that man is without excuse. So verse 27 said, I will send my fear before thee, and I will destroy the people to whom you shall come, and I will make all thine enemies turn thy back unto thee. You could read the rest of this. It gets prettier and prettier, and it gets sweeter every time it's told. So this is what Yahweh said he would do for the people. And then in verse chapter 24, he gave them his laws, his commandments, his statutes. So let's take a few. Somebody need to mute their phone because I'm almost about to cut the conference line off because I can't get whoever it is to hit the mute on their phone because it's, it's, it's messing it up for other people that's listening. So let's move to John chapter 14 and let's see what the Messiah said he's going to do. So when the Most High said what he was going to do. He was going to give them and put them in the position to be his people, to be lights to the world. He said, this is what he's going to do. What did Messiah say he's going to do? In John chapter 14, verse 23, let's look and see what the Messiah says. In John 14, the Messiah says, Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words. He's going to keep my words that were given on Pentecost. He's going to keep my words that I gave them when I went up into the mountain. My words are no different than Moses' words, but what my words are, they're going to give you the fulfillment. They're going to give you the essence of it. It's going to explain to what my words were again. But if you've never understood what Moses said in Genesis, I mean, in Exodus chapter 21, 22, 23, you don't understand the Ten Commandments yet. You're still playing like what you're still drinking milk and you're not taking meat yet. And you walk around thinking you're doing God's will and you don't know how to do righteous judgment. Hebrews chapter 5 says you're a baby. Chapter 6 and 1 tell you to move on to perfection. Let me read some more. If a man love me, he will keep my words, he, and my father will love him, and we will come in unto him and make our abode with him. In chapter 24, 
You move to chapter 5, and the Most High God is telling him how to prepare a place for him to dwell. It was called the tabernacle. It was going to be a type and a shadow of every individual walking before God. And, and when we come together all collectively, we would be the temple of God. It would be not made with hands, just like the one in heaven is not made with hands. The one on earth was made with hands. Am I clear? Yeah. I, I don't want to be unclear. Then verse 24, he that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. In the same way that the Father sent the messenger, in the same way he said, hear him, don't provoke him, because my name is in him, he won't pardon. Here the Messiah said, if you don't hear my word, you don't keep them. The words you hear, they're not mine. It's going to cost you. Why? Because his name is in me. But look at this. It says, these things have I spoken unto you being yet present with you. Now here, here's your transition to where Pentecost will come in. He says, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. Remember the cloud had the Father's name in it, had God's name in it, and don't provoke him. He says, the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, what I have said unto you. I submit to you there, people say the Holy Ghost is going to teach them and bring all things to their remembrance and have never read the book of John, never read the book of Obadiah, never read the book of Titus, never read the book of Habakkuk, never read the book of Hebrew, never read the book of the Revelation, either any of the Gospels. And you say, you don't need a teacher? You don't need to study? The Holy Ghost is going to bring all things to your remembrance. What are you going to bring back to your remembrance? Chaka Khan, do you love what you feel? Do you love what I do? Do you, do you, love, do you want to hear preach, a prince, a, like your Messiah? Or do you want to hear a Michael Jackson say that they don't really care about us? Because whatever is in your memory, that's what's going to come back to your remembrance. He's talking about qualified. Look, he shall bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And if you read Luke chapter 24, starting at 24, he's going to explain to them all of the things that the prophets had said concerning him. So notice, peace I leave with you. My peace give I unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I'm giving you my peace so that you can be peacemakers. Oh, I wish we loved the scripture the way we say that we do. Now notice, the Holy Spirit, they're going to bring all things to your remembrance. Whatever the, the Messiah has taught. The Holy Spirit that's supposed to be with us like the cloud had his messenger in it. What is his reason for giving him to us? Is it so that we can have miracles that we can count so we can say we got a five-fold ministry? You know, I have a problem with the five-fold ministry as it, as it is taught. First of all, you have people saying they believe in the five-fold ministry, don't even know what the ministry of the Christ is. Don't read the scripture. And somebody counted out five and somebody else says it's four. If you say I don't believe in the five-fold ministry, I understand what you're saying. So let me grant you that if what you're saying is this, I believe in it. What they call the five-fold ministry where they give apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and all of this for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's everything Christ was. He was an apostle. He was a pastor. He was a teacher. He was an evangelist. Everything that it says. In other words, when Christ comes into you, he empowers us. Some of us to do one part, another part, some of do three or four parts. It's not that it's something that's just ephemeral, that's just out there, five-fold ministry. What he's doing is giving you the ability to represent the Christ, the Christ as an apostle. He was sent by God. He was this good shepherd, a pastor. He was a teacher. He came to teach the word of the living God. What's the other two? Prophet. He is the prophet that Moses talked about. What's the other one? Evangelist. He went, I must needs go to Samaria. I'm going to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I, I, I also going to send some others to other people that I have which are not in the fold. I am all of that. When you talk about five-fold ministry, or you talk about something to make me look at you as being great, you're an apostle, you're a pastor, you're a bishop, 
That doesn't move me. What moves me are you walking and teaching and living and putting it out like the most high God. And if I never call you a five-fold ministry person, you still are. But I've heard. I try not to get caught up in Christian talk. Because a lot of time it's promoted and promulgated by individuals that don't read the scripture. You think when they brought us on those ships here, they didn't have some pastors? That they didn't have some teachers? That they didn't have any evangelists? That they didn't have people that they say were prophets? And that they didn't say they were sent by God to conquer this land no matter what? And that no matter who lived here, God has given us this land by providence. You had people that were called covenanters. You had people that reformed. You had Scots, Scots, Irish. Don't tell me I don't know what I'm talking about because I know who taught me. And I got his history books. And I've been reading stuff what they did with the American Revolution. I've been reading not only with the American Revolution, but the things that they did when they had the Civil War. But those men, they could have claimed they were fivefold ministry. Until your ministry mirrors the Christ, he's given every, he's showing you what his ministry consisted of. And if our ministry consists of that, if that's what you mean by fivefold ministry, yeah, I believe in it. But I meet a lot of people that say they're apostles. And not really? Of who? You don't even do, do scripture. I get accused of that I'm too cerebral or that I study too much. Let me tell you something. Paul was chosen. He was cerebral. And God used the most of the training, all of the wisdom of the Egyptians. When the Most High determines to use somebody, he don't throw away your knowledge. He doesn't. He uses it to his glory. Why should I not give the Most High everything that I have so that he can use it? I guarantee you, if you ever watch Kobe Bryant practice, he'd give his all. Let people, listen to people talk about it. He would have gone to practice and practice and gone back home before the first practice start, then go practice and stay later and stay earlier. Now Shaq said that's one of the reasons he had a problem, because he wouldn't do that. And if he can do that for a, a mere reward on earth, why can't I give the most high that much? So let's look at why he's given the spirit. John 16 and 7, Jesus says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, come up the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him, just like the cloud was sent with my name in it. Verse 8, and when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. This is what the Messiah did. He reproved the world of sin. He reproved the world of sin and he did it of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me because I'm the word, word of righteousness because I go to my father and you shall see me no more and of judgment because the prince of the earth is judged. Now you're talking about he's judged and you're still going to be walking under his auspices under what he wants. How stupid can you be? So now let's walk back through it. He's going to send the, the comforter. The comfort is coming in his name. The comfort is going to come in his name to reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's why the power of God came down on the mountain to give them his laws, to be his priesthood, to go out into the world and to straighten out things with the Amorites, the Hittites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. So now this is what Messiah said. And the last thing that we see that he said about that is in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, you shall receive power. I know you all know this by heart, but remember, I'm talking about the curse of the Holy Spirit. And most of us ignore the curse of the Holy Spirit. We ignore that there was a fulfillment in the substance, I mean, which is the substance of the shadow of him giving the law. So what is the fulfillment? What is the substance? He does just ignoring the curse don't make it go away. So what did he say? You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses. The word here is marturo, okay? Look at it, martel, see, martes, martyr. And what the word is, is talking about you will be witnesses whether to the death or not. You'll be witness to me both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria where they don't like you. 
Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. The Holy Spirit has come to make you real witnesses. It's not coming to make you great in the sense of the world. He's not coming to make folk like you. He's coming to reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. This is what Messiah said. Shouldn't he be able to tell you what he's for when he said he's going to make him, he's going to come to reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment? Well, when we look, is that what we see happen? Look at two and three acts. Let's look at two and one. Bible says, and when the day of Pentecost shall the oath, which we, which we have talked about being tomorrow, was fully calm because it had to be the 50th day. They were all together with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Just like if I read the account of Deuteronomy, they had a lot of noises and, and the songs talked about the ain't and with different messengers came and they were making noise and as a rushing mighty wind, as a matter of fact, sometimes uh, the angels would have called spirits, those that are celestial, it says God calls them winds. It says there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared to him cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. Didn't it sit on the mountain? Didn't that fire sit down on the mountain? Now, I can take you a little deeper if you want to go there for free. Okay. If you ever go read Daniel 2 and 38, you'll find that when Nebuchadnezzar's statue was described and fulfilled and it was explained, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold. When you read in the book of the Revelation, you talk about the seven mountains, you say the seven mountains, the seven heads. I don't know if the spirit sat on their head or if it just sat on their whole body, but I'm just saying, when it said it filled, he's using the picture of the mountain, which was the shadow to being on the person as the substance. Was I clear? I try to say it clearly. Yeah. Oh, I appreciate you all saying this. You all are probably just advanced. But it says, a rushing mighty wind, it filled all the house where they were sitting there, sitting. There appeared to them cloven tongues like fire and set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. In this case, the Spirit gives them the ability to talk. And it tell you there were different people all over Jerusalem under heaven and the people were confounded because they heard every man speaking his own language. In other words, what do you think they're speaking about? If we are given the substance of what was done in the shadow in Exodus 19 and 24. And it says, and they were all amazed and marveled to one another, behold, of not all of these speak Galileans. And it says, how here we every man in our own tongue where we're born. Most of the time when I hear people speaking tongues, I can't even hear it in my tongue. But he said, in our own tongue. And then they're going to give you the different nations and nationalities. Many of those where our people have been taken into slavery because we turn against God. Then it says, let's go to verse 12. What, 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 I, I got to stop at 11, where it talks about Cretan and Arabia. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. What God has done, is it that what he did whenever he came to the mountain, he told them, first commandment, I am the Lord your God. He told them that. You'll have no other God before me. You'll not make any graven image. Huh? Yes, yeah, most Patrick, you're right. He brought him out of the house of bondage. I went straight to the commandment. You're right. I appreciate that. And no, I don't hurt my feelings. Yeah, it's not getting, I'm the one brought you out of the house of bondage. I'm the one brought you out of Egypt and all of that. You owe me. Okay. Thank you. And it says, and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what mean is this? And they thought they had new wine, verse 13. And he goes through and tells them that this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel in the 16th verse, that it would come to pass in the last days, which would mean that these were the last days. People think the last days he's talking about here is the end of the world. No, it's the end of the temple system. It is the end of the temple system. It's the end of the system where you've got to look at the laws being written on stone, which you probably don't even have them anymore, the Ark of the Covenant. He's going to write them in your heart. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters, your prophesy. You think they're going to just prophesy something? No, they got to prophesy the word of God. You have got to, got to go read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13 and 14. You'll get that. It says, and the young men will see visions. Point is, he was given 
his word. Now, the Holy Spirit was in power. And if you don't believe that the Holy Spirit was giving them the words of the Most High God to be in their heart and in their mind, notice this one thing. The Messiah said, the Holy Spirit will bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, that's a lot of things. When John wrote his thing, there's a lot of works and things that Jesus said that the world couldn't even contain, how much he said and did. But let's look and see if the Holy Spirit, when he's given, is just a time for rejoicing. Sure, it's a time for rejoicing. It's a time to be excited. It's a time for joy. It's a time, but it's a time of reflection upon what you got to do. It's a time of reflection for us to go out and do his will. The curse of the Holy Spirit is tied upon us not seeing that he was given not to make us powerful, not to make us good for our own sake, but to empower us to do his will, empower us to conquer, to defeat his enemies, to build up his kingdom. Let's look, at, let's look and see in Acts chapter 5 and 1. Is there a curse that comes from the Holy Spirit? In Acts chapter 5, verse 1, we're going to see people that lie to the Holy Spirit. Now, if all he is to hear is to give you power and supernatural abilities, be grateful. But if you can see in any way that you can provoke the Holy Spirit and he does not act, in the same manner as the as the messenger or the messenger or the angel in the clouds of Exodus 23, you're not reading well. The Bible says in Acts chapter 5 and 1, there was a certain man named Ananias and his Sapphira, his wife, they sold a possession and kept back part of the price. In other words, we 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 sell it, we keep it back apart for ourselves. His wife being privy to it, and they brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Well, what had happened before then, the people were selling their stuff and they were donating it to help feed the other people that were their people, the Grecian people. But one of the problems is these people are doing it under the pretense that they're selling it all and giving it all. Okay, verse three. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? The same one that people say that they have now. The same one that they say that make them an apostle. The same one that say that make them a prophet and they prophesy. The same one they say make them speak in tongues. The same one they say that they got the gift of healing. The same one that they say got the gift of discernment. The same one that's supposed to be within them to give them what they see as a blessing. Peter says, you have taken the same one. And I'm not going to say these people have never had the Holy Spirit. But he says, why has Satan Feel your heart to lie to him. He's not a toy. He's not here for you. He's not here for you to do what you want to do. He's in charge. He's ruling. He's coming in my name. I am the sovereign ruler. The curse of the Holy Spirit is to treat him as if he's optional. The curse of the Holy Spirit is to provoke him. The curse of the Holy Spirit is not to understand that he comes to fix it where we can fulfill the righteousness of God's law in our hearts and in our minds and that we would walk upright and that the people would look at us and the fear of God and the dread of God would be on the nations. Yeah, I took a pause because that was profound. What profound cost I said it's profound, profound cost it is. But Peter says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and kept back part of the price of the land? While it remains, wasn't it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own in your own power? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but hunt to God. Your body now is supposed to be the people of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which you have of God. And Peter did not say that you had never had the Holy Spirit. But what you have done is you have defiled the temple of the Most High God. You have defiled it. You lied to him. This place is supposed to be sanctified. And I submit to you while the Most High is inaugurating and bringing his spirit to mankind and making it known that the fulfillment of what the Messiah said, you're under such a strict rule that we cannot allow, he cannot allow you to get out here and act. 
He can allow you to go out here and allow the Holy Spirit, allow to the Holy Spirit and see him as something like you will be grieving the Spirit of God. And it's the same kind of thing that you see in Leviticus chapter 10 when the Most High inaugurated his worship through Aaron. And when he did it through Aaron, who was going to be under Melchizedek priesthood, they went and offered strange fire. They offered him something that wasn't authentically what he wanted. They offered him something that wasn't what he wanted. In other words, instead of being true to the Most High and his consecration, you went there with falsehood and he burned them up and killed them right then and there. You don't see the parallel? I do. I don't even have to force it. It's just there. And, and it says, you lied to God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost or gave up the exuco. In other words, he breathed out his last and died. And fear came upon all them that heard these things. And fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The Holy Spirit is setting the precedence. Don't play with me. I wish to God that we were like that. We can go eat him on Sunday because I had an aunt. These were her words. Eat him on Sunday. Hallelujah. And the wickedness that she did was so ungodly that it seemed like it's two kinds of wickedness ungodliness and wickedness. But she's dead now. Verse number six. Can't care about the fall. I bet they're laughing. The Bible says in verse six, and the young, probably because he knows who it is. And the young man arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And about the space of three hours when his wife, not knowing what was done, she came in, she might have sashayed in there, you know. We got some money now, you know, you might have sashayed in there. And Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. You know, this is the price that the husband told me, so much. And she said, yeah, for so much. Oh, praise God. Yes, Lord, you sold it for so much. And Peter says, how is it that you have agreed together to tempt the spirit of Yahweh? And behold, the feet of them that have buried thy husband are at the door, and they shall carry thee out. Then she fell down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead, carrying her forth, buried her by her husband, I like verse 11. This is important to my message. And great fear came upon all the church and as many heard and upon as many as heard these things. Listen to me. When the most high God granted Solomon wisdom, he granted him the spirit of wisdom. And you read in 1 Kings chapter 3, you could probably start at verse 8, but if you read 1 Kings chapter 3 and read all of it, You'll see when the Most High God gave Solomon the wisdom to be able to do judgment. And what the Spirit is for? Yes, sin, righteousness, and judgment. And when he realized, when he showed the people that God has shown me who child this is and the other woman has kidnapped this child, willing to have this child put to death, willing to have this woman put to death because you said she kidnapped the child and she didn't. The Bible said great fear came on the people. They feared God and the king because they saw God was with the king to do judgment. Now, here's the point. Who told Peter that they sold for so much? Who told Peter that they had conspired together? They didn't know that Peter knew. I submit to you that the Most High God was letting these people know, I'm doing judgment. The Holy Spirit put them to death. And then the Bible talks about other gifts. See, this is, I'm going to give you this. I wasn't going to, but I'm going to just go ahead and give you verse 12. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And it says, and they were all of one accord on Solomon's porch. The miracles and things Jesus said, they were to make you witnesses to me. It wasn't for me to go buy me a Rolex. It was to be witnesses to me. But he's word of God. The word of God is about to bring judgment into the earth so that people that did not believe, they would be damned. Those that did believe, they would be saved. You were supposed to be bringing in the word of my, of my father, which is to show there is no neutrality with God. You're either for him or against him. He had signs and wonders to authenticate and validate. But if that's all you need is a sign and a wonder, uh, uh, Jesus said a wicked and adulterous generation, they look for a sign. 
And so the miracles are the help the ungodly. The signs are the help the ungodly. When the Most High God does something for us, it's to build us up. But the signs, the signs were authentication and validation. I understand people don't believe what I'm saying. And you may be able to find some exception to the rule, but it ain't going to be all the way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I, want, I mean chapter 11, I want you to see the curse of the Holy Spirit. When he is mistreated, when he is treated without the dignity and the respect is being God dwelling in us as individual and in the midst of his people. And we take his law and we treat it as if it's something common and unclean. Shabu Oat should make us understand the most high has highly lifted us up. We can't go around the world being like everybody else. We say this and I'm going to pray to God. He's going to forgive me and I'm going to go to God. He's going to do and nobody can be righteous. That's, is that what the Holy Spirit taught you? The Bible said the grace of God has appeared to all men is teaching us to the nine gods of the world of lust so we can still live soberly, righteously, godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious spirit of the great God and Savior that he gave himself for us. Why? Because he wanted to redeem us to himself for people zealous of good works. But, 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 but they say you have no works to do. Well, Ephesians 2 and 9 say we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God has foreordained that we should walk in him. I, I'm being biblical. You, you, you all might be being churchy. You remember, I remember Christianity makes you uh, civilized. If it's not biblical, it makes you civilized. Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20, said, when you have come together into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's supper. It is a communion. Please understand there is a difference. It's not to eat the Lord's Supper, but everyone take it before another his own supper. It is a bread and wine supper. And we look at supper. That's meal. Look at look at the word. The upnion. That's the Greek word. Feast, banquet. It says everyone take his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunk. And you know, like sometimes when you have they would have church dinners. Some people rush up in the line and eat before the children, they get their plate. And then when the children are in line, some of them get back in line to get seconds. Uh, sometimes they get and they get, I need a plate. I got to take a plate home to my husband. I got to take a plate home to my two or three children. And I remember growing up, we used to have a dinner at Fair Street School at what they call Thanksgiving. And all the old people and all the adults would eat while we children would be hungry. They would feed their faces first. I determined when I got grown, that would never happen again. And I'm going to see, it was worse on, it was worse on me and Gary and our family because our mama would have cooked the food, most of it, a great portion of it. My mama takes stuff and make these things called angel biscuits and have yeast in it, smell like rolls in the window, and she would cook it, they would smell so good, I stole a lot of them, which was wicked. Did you, did, did you steal any? Did you ever steal any of her angel biscuit? Or were you a better child than me in every way? I said in every way. <laughs> I qualified it on purpose. Because I already know you were a better child than me. But it says, you know, this thing say my battery is low. Okay, give me a second, you all. I want to do it. <laughs> okay. I had to get up because what happens is it's plugged in, but some reason it lost connection. I didn't want to go through that whole process. So it says verse 21, for everyone take it before another in supper, and one is hungry and the other is drunken. So when people say that they had wine, it was watered down. Quit lying. You don't get drunk off. You don't get drunk off that. Don't go teaching your prohibition that they did in the 1900s to make money off of people until they could tax it. Okay. Don't go tell me prohibition that made the Kennedys rich when they were here doing their licking stuff like that. Please don't tell me that. It's a sin to be drunk, and here you are. One is hungry, and the other one is sin. He's a drunk. It says, "What have you not houses to eat and to drink? And drink your wine at home." You can eat at home if you're greedy. Look at it. What have you not houses to eat and to drink in or despise you? The church of God despises the key word. And shame them that have not. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? No, I praise you not. For I have received of Yahweh the Lord 
and delivered unto you that the, that the Lord Jesus the same night when he was betrayed, betrayed to bread, and when he had given thanks, he break it, and he said, take, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do remembrance of me. And it says, after the same manner, he took the cup, and when he had sucked, this is the cup of the New Testament, in my blood, this do off, and you drink in remembrance of me. In other words, this is the commemorate, commemoration of my death till he come. It says, whosoever shall eat bread and drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. You gonna plead the blood? They just say you plead the blood on that. Well, you know, I I, I, I took three plates off and, and yeah, yeah, I got a little lit, but I plead the blood. I plead the blood. I plead the blood, the blood, the blood. <laughs> I get tired of hearing people say that. Just like, what does that mean? And they can't answer. Are you saying you plead that Jesus died for you? That's beautiful. Or are you living like he didn't? These are people, these are people that Paul's going to go through and talk about you receive the Holy Spirit in the very next chapter. Am I right, Patrick? Okay. And so you're guilty of the body and the blood. He said, but let a man examine himself and let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the body of the Lord. Now let's see the curse of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what you're living in. The, the Holy Spirit is what write God's word, his laws in your heart with the finger of God. He said, for this cause many are, many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. Okay? So let's look and see that sleep. Let's see what kind of verb that is. Present, passive, indicative. That means that's a statement of fact. He said, for well, if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Well, the Holy Spirit brings you, baptizes you into the body of the Christ. And you don't discern his body. You get to be guilty of his blood and his body. Don't go pleading the blood. Don't know what you're doing. The blood is not a talisman. The blood is the representation of his life. Ephesians 4 and 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. You mean to tell me that the Holy Spirit that was given on the day of Pentecost can be grieved? Yes. But they say you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Seals are made to be taken off, you all. God is made to be taken off by the right person. Do you understand when the children of Israel were brought into the land of Canaan, the only person that could pluck them out of the land was God. He said, if you go do like they did, I'll pluck you out of the land and I'll scatter you. Am I lying, you all? Didn't he say, I had a message one time I called God the big plucker because he would pluck them out of the land. He's the one that spew people out. Yeah, I could call him the big spitter. I'll spew you out of my mouth. We play with God. We, and my wife says sometimes we play too much. But let's look at how the Holy Spirit is described in the book of Isaiah 63 and 10. The children of Israel, they had God's righteous laws. The people that get the Holy Spirit, they should be getting God's righteous commandments and his laws for us to live written in our hearts and our minds so that we can do what Romans 8 and 4 says, fulfill the righteousness of the law. He tells us not to grieve him. Ananias, grieve him. People that were doing stuff unworthily, hey, grieve them. And many other such like things have happened that throughout the scriptures. But in Isaiah chapter 63, verse 10, it says, but they grieved, uh, but they rebelled and vexed. That word vexed is the same as grieved. But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy and fought against them. I don't understand how it is we can always teach the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, how good he is, fivefold ministry, tongues, prophecy, healing, land of hand, discernment, 
help. Oh, the Holy Spirit is so good, and you don't live righteously. That Holy Spirit is not your friend. He is your enemy. You can't read Leviticus chapter 26, where it comes after chapter 23, where it gives God's feast days, when it starts telling you what God wants. And then he started giving the Jubilee in chapter 25 and not understand that the law that God gave, the very law that was so blessed and blessful for you is the same one that will curse you. How much more would the Holy Spirit not be consistent with the Father and with the Son? Ah, listen to what the Word of God say about you all that don't love God's Word like it should be. I don't care if it's me. It says, for well, we sin willfully after this, I'm Hebrews 10 and 26. For well, we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth. What do you think they got on the day of Pentecost? When do you think God wrought his laws on their hearts and in their mind by the spirit? After you received the knowledge of the truth, there remained no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for a judgment because the Holy Spirit is going to do his judgment. It doesn't matter if it's on you or somebody else. Judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Listen, he despised Moses' law in that covenant where the law was either a blessing or a cursing. Read 28, Deuteronomy 29 and 30. You see, I'm not wrong. Despised Moses' law, died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore a punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the Son of God encountered the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sacrificed as an unholy thing. You don't think the blood is something special? You don't think the blood is something righteous? You pleading the blood in your dirt? What's the difference in you being drunk and pleading the blood in your dirt? And have done despite, look, and have done despite unto the spirit of grace. God has given his spirit of grace to empower you and you don't care. Well, well, well. I Somebody really need to mute their phone on the conference line. And it says, it's a fearful thing. Well, let me go back. If we know him to say, vengeance belongs to me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. Then he recompense with Ananias and Pharaoh. Then he recompense with people that were sick and was already dead. He said, the Lord will judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hand of the living God. This is New Testament. Well, one of the problems that we have in our modern church is that we don't feel that the Holy Spirit gives us any instruction, that he doesn't do like he did in Pentecost or the first when he had Shabbat Oak when he gave his laws. And we're rebellious and we go against the Most High God. And we don't think God will put us to death or cut us off. But there's a real problem because we don't understand how the Bible is very cohesive. In 1 Samuel 15 and 23, I'm going to show you a man that had the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to be long. I'm going to show you a man that had the Holy Spirit. He was anointed. He was appointed. He was chosen. He had prophesied. He had been able to have a new heart given by God. But he did not stay with God's righteous law. All of the kings were supposed to take a copy of God's law and write it down so that they would not do what this man did or what David did when he took Bathsheba. Read the 17th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. But it says when Saul, who was anointed, appointed, chosen, given another heart and another spirit, he didn't keep God's commandment when God was executing righteous judgment on the sin of the Amalekites. The sin and the righteousness, they sinned. They were supposed to execute righteous judgment. So he was supposed to be fulfilling what the Holy Spirit was fulfilled. He didn't do it. So Samuel told him, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. When you rebel against the word of God and you're rebellious against the Holy Spirit, you might as well be doing witchcraft when you're doing your do. And it says, stubbornness is as iniquity. And Jesus says, depart from me, you that work iniquity. It's as iniquity and idolatry. That's the same thing as fornication with another God. 
And Samuel tells Saul, the anointed, appointed, chosen, the man that had another spirit, because you have rejected the word of Yahweh, he has also rejected thee from being king. This is serious when you look at the whole scripture. Now let's look, the most high God, we talked about fivefold ministry. We talked about the gifts that he gave. And I want you to understand, I believe in the gifts of the most high God. Really, even if I didn't believe in the gifts of the most high God, that doesn't stop them from being extant. So that's not my prerogative. But Paul said, and I'm going to skip through. What you say, Gary? I don't know what you're saying. You should say what extent means. Oh, extent means what's in existence now. See, when you had that thing that you were doing like our daddy, I couldn't understand your word. It says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Don't be ignorant. Don't be ignorant concerning spiritual gifts because if you're ignorant, you might die or you might mistreat someone. He told them that they once were dumb, they were fallen idols. And he says, I want you to understand in verse three, that no man speaking about the spirit of God calls Messiah a curse. And no one can say Jesus is Yahweh, but by the spirit of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit empowers you to know, to recognize, to discern, hear the word of God. And you know that he is God, but not you. He said there's different kind of gifts, the same spirit. They're not in competition. There are differences of administration. Some people do things one way. Some people have a different ministry. You call fivefold ministry or whatever. It's still the same spirit, so it's the same ministry. That's why I can tell you that the Messiah embodied all of that in who he was and what he did. And you can count on whatever. Know what you're talking about when you talk to people because they may have a different meaning. Many times they do. I've seen people roll on the floor. I've seen people be told, take your rent money and give it. I've seen people have to shut in all night right there on Martin Luther King Jr. Drive, right there across from Gus Thornhill Funeral Home. I've seen, I've been there to watch. I've seen all kinds of things in church. Some things that you that I've seen in church quite amazing. I see them roll down and fall on the floor and, and people are right there to put cover on them. Why are you going to be showing your bottom and stuff in the church? Why are you going to be running looking stupid in the church? You're going to call that the Holy Ghost and, and, and nobody can stop you. But then when you walk away from the church, where's your power? You put on a show for other people? Or is what you do in convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment? I, I, don't, I mean, you can enjoy it and rejoice in the Lord. That's great. But if it stops right there, what good is your Pentecostalism? But when your God is the kind of God, where you go, young man? I went no whither. I did not see that man turn around and give you some stuff. In there, time to get stuff up. Wait, 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 ma'am, and one to give it to. There's a time to receive good and don't. Second Kings, chapter five. The leprosy of them will be on you and your children forever. I, I'm, I'm talking about we, we really need to understand that most of the things that we get, sometimes there's some people that don't really study God's word. So you take some truth and mix it with error. It makes the whole thing look bad, but it doesn't make everything look bad. Yeah. But it's the thing that you're presenting to the world. It's not giving them a clear picture. Just like Christianity brought to America. Look at the picture that it's given. If I did not already love the word of God, if I weren't already reading it, I, I don't know if anybody could convince me, especially if I learned history first. That's why men like Dr. Sheikh Dio. Dr. John Henry Clark, Dr. Ivan Van Sertiman, and many other brilliant men, they have a hard time with Christianity because they know more about history and what was done. And so, Tim, why do you talk this stuff? Because I have young people that's under us. They have young people that are listening, and they need to understand their answers. And the representation that was given does not necessitate that this is what God said. It's a picture like the rainbow was given as God's coming. It had nothing to do with LGBTQRSTUV, whatever letters they add to it. 
but what we need to understand what's true. So it has diversity of gifts, gifts of administration, the same Lord, diversity of operation, the same God, but it says the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Does that mean profit to go get money? Or is it to have the same kind of success Joshua had? You see, Joshua was supposed to have good success. Joshua was supposed to profit. Whatever the soul of his feet stuff, that was supposed to be their land. His, pro his profiting would be doing God's will and making things work out for the people of God. His profiting wouldn't be a man. I'm going to have me too big. That way I mean, that way I mean, a big plane. I'm gonna get a fancy. I'm gonna bury you there. Hey, COVID, I curse you. Okay, that was a Joshua's prophet. I mean, profiting. And then it says, faith by the same spirit, gifts of healing by the same spirit, working of miracles, discerning the spirit, different kinds of tones. You see this? All of this is given by God. So don't let somebody tell me. And I don't believe in that. I just went through it quick because I want to end the message. But he says, the body, but look, all of these miracles that are given, we're all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, and have been made to drink of one spirit. The body is not one member, but many. What is he talking about? All of these different gifts. If I tell you you got to have the, if I tell you you got to be able to heal and you ain't saved, you don't have evidence of the Holy Spirit. If I tell you you don't have the ability to discern spirit, you don't have the Holy Spirit. If I tell you you don't have the gift of prophecy, I'm telling you wrong. That's because you see in the book of Acts, many people would come out with one gift first. That does not say that that's the prescription or the proscription. That's a description of what happened. Gosh, how are we going to be like that? And through the spite, the spirit of grace. Gary, go put that plug back in again. Push it in right there. It's acting. I hear it. I need you to do it quickly. It's the one to go with this. So push it, and I'll see it move. Okay, it starts to move. I have to bring my other one next time. Put it in another one. Put it in another one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's moving now. They're going to be trying, when I get to this point, they're going to try to do me like that. Uh -uh, I got my ear open. But notice, it says, can the foot, say, and they go through and say, can the foot take the place of the hand, the hand, et cetera. It let you know everybody got their place. But then I want you to look at what the Holy Spirit says through the Apostle Paul. Paul says in verse 29, he said, well, in 28, he says, God has set some in, he said, some in the church. First, those that are sent apostles, prophets, thirdly, teachers, that they're in their miracles. You see where it don't say um, evangelists? You see where it doesn't, you see where it say apostles, prophets, teachers, they'll say pastors? Because some of those gifts entail that. So he doesn't have to say that. It's about being like the Christ. An apostle sent, he was a prophet, he's a teacher. But he sounds like a shepherd, so he's a pastor, and he's going along doing, giving the good news. What I'm saying is, I don't get excited about fivefold like some people do. I want to know what you mean. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. But if I meet somebody the first time I meet you and I, I say, I'm Tim, I'm apostle so and so and so and so. And I'm like, or the first time I meet you, you tell me I'm Dr. So and so and so and so and so, or I'm so and so and so, Esquire. I don't care, you Esquire. I really don't. Neither do I care when I meet you, you reference so and so. First thing I want to know, what, what, do you, what do you teach? I'm getting ready to start asking you questions because you trying you make me think you're trying to make me think you over me. I'm gonna look up to you. Let me look up to you because of your character and who you are, not your title. I try not to confuse the two. Do you you all know my wife? So I go and say, you know, I'm Andrina's husband. And, <laughs> and can you can you imagine? Can you imagine if I were treating her like dog squeeze? And she probably like, if she would even be around me. Your fruit matters. Okay, but notice what he says. Are all apostles? Is everybody an apostle? Is everybody a prophet? Is everybody a teacher? The all work miracles. 
He says, have all the gifts of healing. Do all speak with tongues? You got the answer from the first part. No. Do all interpret? No. But we, 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 we go against the Holy Spirit and we're going to try to force everybody to have the same gift. It's not what the Bible is teaching. But, we, but what does Paul say in his didactic teaching? Didactic. He's going to give you, he's going to give you premises. He's going to give you conclusions. He's going to give you propositions. And he's going to give you the way to look at that proposition and analyze it. Although he said a case, because some were thinking all had to be the same. Okay. He says, though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not charity, I'm becoming a sounding brass or a teaching a singing symbol. I can, I can have that gift and I'm just making noise. James Brown used to have a song. He said, like a dull knife. It just ain't cutting. You keep talking loud and ain't saying nothing. Yeah, he used to say that. But verse two, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mystery and have all knowledge and have all faith that I can remove mountains and have no charity, I am nothing. We would be thinking this is the greatest apostle, a prophet. This is the great man of God. Paul said, if you can do this and don't have the love of God, which is the commandment, this is the love of God that we keep his commandment. And the second commandment is going to be like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I would submit to you that if you got all of that and you don't have the love of God, Love for God and love of God. He said, you're nothing. But we say you something. And he said, I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. Let's feed the homeless. Let's have a feed the homeless thing. And that's going to make us righteous. Whether we still practice all kinds of immorality and ungodliness. He said, though I bestow all of my goods to feed the poor. If I do the analysis of Sapphira the right way. And though I give my body to be burned. I become a martyr. And have not charity and profit me nothing. The only point that I'm trying to make here is you can have the gift of what God has given. You can have it and not have God. You don't have to walk with God to have a miracle. Genesis and Jim Bray didn't have one. They didn't have the God of heaven, but they sure had miracle. And then it, Janice and Jim Bray, those are the two. And so... Anyway, when we go to 14, I just want you to understand what he's saying. The best of the gifts is charity. He says, abide these three, three things, four, I mean, 13 and 13. Faith, hope, and charity are God faith. These three, the greatest of these three is charity. It didn't mention anything in chapter 12. It didn't mention anything that's in chapter 12 at all. And by the most time, not mentioning any of those things that are in chapter 12, what we end up seeing is that we have emphasized something that the most time did not emphasize as much. And then the last scripture that I got on this, mute your phone for me, my brother. In chapter 14, verse 24, 1 Corinthians, it says, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course. That means in the same kind of thing like when they had the priesthood. By course, it says successively and let one interpret. This is let one interpret. Let me show you on the, on the right-hand side, it's a verb, present, active, and it's imperative. It's a commandment. It is not a suggestion. If there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. This is what the Bible says. This is where rebellion comes in. Rebellion comes in is because God burns it and your pastor get up and let everybody speak in their heavenly language. But the word of God gets overran by the traditions of man. That's why when you start talking about, I'm going to do things like my pastor say, although God says something else, you should never complain about anybody making us slaves over here. You should never complain about anybody robbing us, burning us, making us walk all the way from Tennessee all the way to Louisiana, or making us walk to Missouri or with chains on our neck, say nothing because God's word doesn't matter to you when you think you're serving God. They thought they were serving God when they say God has given them this land and they gave it to them and they even made songs about it. This land is your land. This land is my land. But it did not mean for the African slaves. Look at it. 
if there be no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. It didn't say he could not ever speak it. Let him speak to himself and to God if you're in an assembly. Let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. That's why sometimes we have panels. Y'all may want to disagree with me. That's fine. But bring it. Let's come and let's get together and do it the way the Lord say. And then it says, if there be revealed to any other that sit it by, look, if anything be revealed to another sit it by, let him first hold his peace. For you all may prophesy one by one that all may learn and it all may be confident. And it says, the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. That's why sometimes you all say something and I mess up and say, what do you say, Patrick? And we and because I started out with Exodus and it says, I am the Lord your God. You, uh, Patrick, Patrick said real softly, said, I'm the Lord that brought you out, out of Egypt. All out of bondage. Okay, he's right. I left that part off. That part never need to be left let off, left off. He didn't just start telling you what to do. He told you who he was, who he is, what he is to you. Now that's just how I want to roll with God's word. The curse of the Holy Spirit is to not take him as sovereign ruler, as the one that writes God's law, his word in your heart for us to obey. Because any curse that is given that was going to come upon the people that didn't obey his words on you, you can grieve the Holy Spirit. But I again, if I get up in here and I start speaking in tongues, I've heard it enough. They used to say I come in a Honda when I was younger. If I get up in the assembly and a lot of people in the assembly doing this and we're rebellious against the spirit, we're in rebellion together. And the Bible says that's the same as witchcraft. Because what if I do this in the assembly and I get what I want? What if I get up in the assembly and I start speaking in tongues? My mind thinking about God and I do it in front of everybody and I do it 10 minutes. And I go home, my wife is well. As a matter of fact, not only is she well, she's about two inches taller. Uh, she about, can lift 50 more pounds than she could before. About two seconds faster in the 40. And all of that. But I was rebellious. Did I get what I want through witch, witchcraft? He says rebellion is just the sin of witchcraft. I mean, just think, well, you might disagree with me. Just think about it. And stubborn, you know this is what God said. I don't care. I feel it. So you do it anyway. He says stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Am I worshiping my power to speak in tongues more than the God that gives me power to wait till I get by myself, maybe in my car? Maybe outside. There was a man out here one day. Patrick was out here. He was trying to get us to do something that he's going to do for prisoners. And he would say, that you're going to do this. And then he would say something. And he would, every time he would say something, he would do that as if it authenticated and validated everything he said. We were supposed to be subservient and there could be no question. Remember that, Patrick? And I asked him, I said, we out here, a lot of us are what they call church people. Are we supposed to be having church? And what did he ask to me, Patrick? Did he tell me yes or no? You don't remember? First he said yes. Then I asked him. I said, then why everything you say, you speaking in tongues? I said, why are you doing that? I said, the, the, the Bible said it's, it's to be done by course two or three. And if, one, if, if there's no interpreter, to keep silence. I said, but every time you say something, you keep doing it as if I'm supposed to believe everything you say and that what you're saying coming straight from God. I said, but this is what God said. And he wouldn't answer me. As a matter of fact, I ain't going to address. They said, ask Pastor uh, Gray. Then he never asked Pastor Gray. I said, I said Pastor Gray didn't, say, didn't do that. You did. I wasn't being mean, but you out here doing stuff in my ear hole. You doing all this stuff to me. And then you saying stuff, and then you do this walk, and you do this like this, like you done said something great, and you being rebellious. So after that, he said he wasn't going to address me. He shunned me. 
The Bible says in, in, in 1 Peter, and I told him, I said, 1 Peter 3 and 15 says, Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Be ready always to give a man an answer for the reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. Where's your God then? I ain't telling you I know everything, but doggone, we better, we better get our mind right because the world is looking. Imagine I'm in a group, of, when I used to go speak at the school, at the college, and think about all those atheists, Buddhists, and all those different kinds of people there at the college. And then I go to look, 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 and they ask me, what did that mean? And I say, I ain't gonna answer you. I ain't gonna, because those people that were in some of the classes there, they would stay after class. It's kept talking to me. I remember one time I went there in the, in the assembly, what was that called? What hall is that, Gary? I forgot, but I used to go there. It was called, uh, it's a lunchroom. They had a name for it. Is it Civic Activities Room? Yes. Uh, uh, Student Activities yeah. Building. Yeah. So I went there, Patrick, and I was talking, and everybody was making noise. They were like, they were ignoring, you know, just, and I said, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. And God said that there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the dark. I was just going through because I'm getting ready to make a point about something. And did everything get quiet? Oh, everything got quiet at the word of God. And after class, we had discussions. They could ask questions things like that. We can't answer questions because we too big. We got a problem. The curse of the Holy Spirit is taking it for granted and not obeying him. But with that, I'm going to close the meeting. Let me just close the and go to discussion. But this is the point. Pentecost, Shabbat Oat, was the thing that was to prepare us to go out in resurrection power to know what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to be children. If I'd have read 1 Corinthians 14 and 20, I better read because I say he just making that up as he go. All of this is about spiritual gifts. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14 and 20, brethren, be not children in understanding how be it in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. Grow up. Grow up. Quit playing. Quit pleading the blood when you do dirt. Quit doing dirt. And that the blood means something good for you. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for trying to equip us to be a perfect man to reach the measure of the stature of the fullness of your son, that we won't be tossed henceforth to and fro by the slight of men and craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive us, that we might grow up into him, the head, your son, even the Christ. Help us, I pray, in the blessed name of your Messiah, Jesus the Christ. Amen, amen, and amen. Our class is open for discussion, for rebuttal. You can tell me how much you hated what I said, if that's the case, or you can even add to what I said. It's open, discussion time. Ah, oh, it's very, very, very and, and Brother Marshall joined us. You still on with us too, Brother Marshall? You had to go? That's okay if you... If, if you want to, so, okay. Uh, I kind of came in on the, on the back end. Can you hear me? I heard you. Yeah. Yeah, so I kind of came in on the back end. That's all right. You, you can call me one day. We talk about it while you're working. Yeah. So I'm just I'm going to kind of mute you because I got some other stuff going on. I'm just going to say. All right. All right, Dr. Marshall. Okay. Any, okay. Anybody else? Gary, you were getting ready to say something, and I thought it was going to be good. Yeah. You thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just saying it was good. Um, I, I don't really have much more to say, but I was saying Matthew 7, and I might have threw you off because you got some people claiming that they did some things in the name 
Well, I, I thank you for that. And um, I was going to show if if you're looking on your, if you're looking on what is it on, on the Zoom, I want to show you something on Zoom. Okay, so I tried to call. He called, and I wasn't able to. I wasn't able to get him. It it, it, it took a minute, but it's it's okay. Um, let's see, new share. And let's go here. I didn't show this in the class because I saw the time it gone, but since we're in discussion from Britannica, okay? If you look up Pentecost in Britannica, which Britannica is this? I don't see to give it to you. So anyway, it is HTTP. You can see it if you're looking. But it says Pentecost also called White Sunday. First, it's Whit Sunday. Pentecost from the Greek Pentecost Day, 50th day, a major festival in the Christian church celebrated on the Sunday that falls on the 50th day of Easter. It commemorates the descent of the Holy Spirit on the apostles and other disciples following the crucifixion resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, Acts of the Apostles, chapter two. It marks the beginning of the Christian church's mission to the world. The Jewish, it didn't say the Jews, it said the Jewish, because we understand Jewish is a religion, it's a construct of, Tal of Talmudism. Uh, they call it what is called oral law. And if you read the background on the Kassars, you, you can learn that, but I'm not going to teach that right now. The Jewish feast of Shavuot was primarily a thanksgiving for the first fruit of wheat harvest, but it was later associated with the remembrance of the law given by Moses on Sinai, the church's transformation of the Jewish feast to a Christian festival was thus related to the belief that the gift of the Holy Spirit to the followers of Jesus was the first fruit of a new dispensation and fulfilled and succeeded the dispensation of the law, which means it is no longer under the auspices of the Israelite or the Jews, that Nash church. If you look at the people right here, as you go, you get a chance to see the people uh, that really are in the position of doing this thing with Easter. And it says, when the festival was first celebrated in the Christian church, it is not known, but we do know when the Most High set it up. In the first year after they came out of Egypt. Now, it says it was mentioned, it said it was mentioned in the work of the Eastern church 
the epistola apostolorium in the second century. And in the third century, it was mentioned by Origen, theologian, head of the catechetical school of Alexandria and by Tertullian, Christian priest and writer of Carthage. And you go down and it says in the early church, Christians were referred to the 50th day period beginning Easter as Pentecost. Baptism was administered both at the beginning of Easter and at the end of Pentecost of the Paschal season. Eventually, Pentecost became more popular for a time of baptism than Easter in Northern Europe. Remember, I said they brought their form of Christianity to us and put it on us and captured us and stole us and enslaved us and beat us and put us on ships while they raped and fed some of the uh, croc I mean, not crocodiles, the shark. But they bring in Easter from Northern Europe and England. And it says, the feast is commonly called, look at it, White Sunday. I didn't make that up. White Sunday, and in parentheses, Whit Sunday, for the special white garments worn by the newly baptized. In the first prayer book of Edward the Sixth, 1549, the feast was officially called Whit Sunday, and this name is continued in the Anglican Church. The Anglican, Anglican Church is where you get the holiness church from. You see, the Anglican Church came from King Henry VIII, and King Henry VIII is where you get the Moravian Church. I mean, you know, from the Anglican Church to the Church of England. And then uh, when you get the Moravian, you get what it's called the Methodist. And from the Methodist, that's where you get the holiness. And this is where your Pentecostalism it has its roots in the Anglican Church. We had its roots in the Roman Catholic Church. We had its roots in things that they had done when they came away from, coming away from the Holy Scripture that was written to the first people that the Most High gave it to. And it became totally like the Sunday that it represents. It says in the Catholic and other Western church, priests often wear red vestments during Pentecost to symbolize tongues of fire that descended on the disciples from the Holy Spirit. Members of the congregation still wear red in some tradition. And the altar is commonly dressed in red frontal cloth. And then as I slide down for those that's looking, they get to see the epiphany. They see none of us representing the epiphany. And then when you go down and show baptism, they see this man that looks very effeminate. And he's, I guess he's supposed to be the Jesus. And then you see all these other people. And then you just keep looking and you see, and then you'll hear people say stuff to Tim. Uh, God doesn't see color, but I've been doggone, I see a color. I do. And I just see the things that they do. I just thought I would just bring that out that people could see. Things, things, things matter. Any other comment on our class today? No, you got one? Go ahead, Patrick. No, put the microphone toward you. All right. What you got? It's okay. You were in, um, actually, before that, when you, when you were just reading what you were reading. About um, White Sunday? Yeah, but even before that, um, you were talking about how it's the feast of the weeks and they're celebrating the first fruits. Mm -hmm. And um, it made me think of Christ being the first fruits. Yeah. Um, first Corinthians 15, as it turns to um, the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And, um, it also, I think I can give another law to, and how it talks about, I believe it's Psalm 78, about the law being inheritance given to Israel. It may be in Deuteronomy 33, similar. Mm -hmm. But um, also, when um, when you were talking about, um, as far as in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit came upon them, uh, like Psalm 5. And how it's related to um, the fire on the mount. And, um, and it also made me think of uh, Isaiah 4, where it talks about um, the spirit of judgment and the burning mm. on Mount and Mount Zion. So um, all the people together are to be part of the Zion and all the people in the, that are Zion are part of it. And um, 
the fire upon each of them is symbolic of that as well. Um, even when you think about an inheritance, um, we're to be born of the water and of the spirit. So that's how we're born of God. And so they were um, they were born again when that happened on that day for them. And so when we believe in the Lord Jesus, we, we receive his word and we receive his Holy Spirit. We're born from above and we're born of the water and of the spirit. And so we've been given then the spirit of adoption whereby we cry our father. Yes. Um, giving us power to become the sons of God. Um, you see consistently throughout scripture about um, inheritance, about bringing forth fruit. Even if we would have continued in Acts 2 when they asked Peter, Peter, actually, you see judging there because he's going to start saying whom you crucify. He's going to talk about the determinate counsel of God. And he's going to say, you crucify. And he's going to be like, what should we do? They were pricked in the heart. What should we do? And he told them to repent. It was just like John the Baptist said, repent or bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. It was just like Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, just like John the Baptist said. So you see this thing consistently of changing your mind. You see the thing consistently of fruit, which um, even if you look at children, children are representative, they're fruit. And even with inheritance um, in the Psalms, it also talks about uh, children being in inheritance. It also talks about in, within your inheritance going into the end. He always kept talking about what a land of milk and honey would be like a real rich land and be able to bring forth fruit. So within one's inheritance, well, a lot of times they're supposed to have, they would have a vineyard which brings forth fruit. And so you see that consistent theme through that, like you, like you say a lot, you didn't just say what it is to be saved. We are to bring forth fruit Amen. unto God. For real, 100%. And so when you see even, um, when you mention uh, first and first Corinthians 11, as well about what they were doing, it made me think of when they were just going and they were going to get the food, we're going to be, you know, Greedy, you were just going to do whatever. It made me think in 1 Corinthians 5, um, we can start at 7, where it says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle, not the company with fornicators, as you did mention that yet not altogether with the fornicators of the world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, but then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called, called a brother be a fornicator or a covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard, that was mentioned in first one, or an extortioner with such an one no, not to eat. We don't do that, do we? We so, don't. We don't care about what God's words say. And so that ties in with in First Corinthians eleven. That ties in even in the other chapter where um, in the other chapter where it talks about with the communion um, of of God. Oh, that's in First Corinthians ten. So right before he was talking about judgment in First Corinthians ten. Then he moves and he goes back to talking about it again in 1 Corinthians 11. Because in 1 Corinthians 10, we saw where it talked about they were baptized on the Moses in the cloud and the sea. They all ate the same spiritual meat. They all drank the same spiritual drink, where they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And, and notice this. When you read that, these are people that got his law. That's the six. That's the six hundred five thousand plus some more. Some more got to die. Right. Exactly. Keep going, Patrick. That's good stuff. Um, now these things were our examples. Like when you talk about type and shadow, these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lust. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them, as it is written: the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So even with what it said in chapter 11, rising up just to eat and drink and play and be joy, but you're not doing and what they you were, And they were naked. <laughs> yeah. And they, they, were, they were doing the naked, okay? <laughs> okay. 
and and and, and the next but neither let us commit fornication. So the next verse. See, the next verse. They, some people get naked before they fornicate. Okay. Neither let us commit fornication. That some of them committed. Oh, we don't talk about this. Why they don't talk about this? Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth Take heed lest he fall. Okay. And then you can just keep saying something, just four oh, people, and you just doing it. It's like what you think and you stand, but you you flee over there and you falling. You falling. There have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. See how good he is. Indeed. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break. Wait a minute. The cup of blessing which we which bless. we bless mm -hmm. and the cup that we drink. And the same cup that's in chapter 14. They say you drink it, not discerning the body of the Lord. It's quite consistent to say, don't play with, don't play with that with your mouth, because you 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 can blast him and be irreverent with your mouth. But go ahead, Patrick. You you, you bring that stuff right now. The bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of Christ? But we being many, now this sounds like chapter right here too. For we being many are one bread and one body, but we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifice of partakers of the altar, right? The priest, Leviticus, you read Leviticus 5. What say I then, that the idol is anything or that which is offered and sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice the devils and not the God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devil. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devil. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are, are we, we stronger, stronger than, than he? he? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all, all things edify not. I appreciate that. Is there anyone else? Well, I appreciate you all. I just went through and just clicked on some of the stuff that Britannica had, and I was just letting people that that might still happen to be on see that there is a Christianity that has been given and forced on the world. It has nothing to do with the most I got except the terms, but not the essence that the terms that were used were allowed to do things to us that shouldn't be done. How much more then should we not use the terms to go out and be wicked, to seduce women, to seduce little boys, to seduce little girls, to beat people out of their money, to make people look at us as being some great power of God like Simon. Let's be faithful to the most high God. And let's do his will. He gave us the spirit. He gave us the word. He's even given us the time that we can think about it. So tomorrow is Shabbat Odin memories. Think about it. If you don't go somewhere where, they, where they'll be doing Shabbat Odin. Because I'll, be, I'll do some Shabbat Odin at home. But as I make myself more and more acclimated to get out of Western mindset, and I'm getting to understand and enjoy the benefit. One thing I will say is the most time have even let people that help sell us into slavery, that have done things to in the media to make us look stupid, 
He's allowed them to have so much power in the world that although many times they follow Kabbalah and all of these different things, they still made it where if you, if you really want to be off on Sabbath, it's accepted. And if you want to really start paying attention to the Most High Speech Day, they've already paved the way. Now, when are we going to go in and move into what is ours? The heathen that build houses and lands. They didn't build a land, but they cultivated the land. And the Most High said, I'm going to give it to you. Why would we not move into what the Most High has already made available to us in this country that was not set up by us or for us to those days that they already have set apart? in the hours. Merciful King, eternal, immortal, and invisible, grant us the mindset to be obedient to you, to walk in your power, and not do things against your Holy Spirit and grieve him, although you've given us grace. Help us, I pray, in the blessed name of your holy child, the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, as we call him. I'm going to ask Elder Lane, did he have anything to say before I shut it down? Elder Lane, did you have anything to say, my brother? I don't think so. Well, I appreciate everybody joining us, and let's get back together on Tuesday.